Well, you're in good form of voice tonight. I thank you for that. That's, uh, and thanks again to Alastair for filling in. He's uh, a good soul who just jumped to it when I asked him, and I'm thankful for that. I want to look at this passage uh, as we continue our studies in Exodus, and um, we're looking at Exodus 13. And uh, the heading I came up with today was the parting, the parting of old ways. Now, you might think the parting means the parting of the Red Sea, but we'll get to that uh, hopefully next week. But this week, the parting is leading up to that crossing of the Red Sea. But it also means for us that it's a parting of old ways, and that's what we see uh, relieved revealed to us in, in this chapter, uh, a part in of many different aspects of life. Uh, firstly, the relevance of what the yeast is for us and the part in of, a, of our ways, uh, the part in of the firstborn and what that means to us and the part in from Egypt and leaving it behind. So we look at the first aspect, the yeast, and, and what does it mean for us? And uh, if we were to read in chapter 12 of 39, we see a lead up to this passage. So in 1239, it says to us, with the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. So we can see why in this first few verses of uh, Exodus 13, we, we get the understanding of how consecration is key to the Israelites key to what they must do in their life as they go forward. And um, when we look at the understanding of why the Lord brings this to their, to their highlight, is that yeast is known really as, as sin in the Bible, although Jesus did speak about yeast in another way, the kingdom of God being yeast, and, and how it it creeps about silently and making its, its way known. So, uh, uh, but predominantly, yeast is known in the Old Testament as sin. And you remember Jesus spoke about it also uh, when He brought to us in Matthew's Gospel false teaching, the false teaching that we see in chapter 16. And I just want to read that to you so that we get an idea. This is what Jesus um, had in mind for the Israelites. So in, in chapter 16 of Matthew's gospel, we see verses 6 to 12, he speaks to those who had gathered. Oh, sorry, turned to the wrong book there. So Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, and we see verse 6 to 12. Well, we'll read from verse 5. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, Is it because we didn't bring any bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you of little faith, why are you talking about yourselves, about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves and the five for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How is it you don't understand that it was that I was talking not about bread, but be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then 
they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We, we get this understanding that false teaching then is, is rife, even way back in the time of the Exodus, the false teaching of those who spread uh, malicious and wrong understandings about what was good for them. God's heart for His people is, is always good. It's always He wants the best for us. But we see in the heart of man, we see this, this um, tainted understanding of what is good. And it always seems to come down to oneself. You'll hear me saying, there is an I in sin, and that I is me. And it's me who brings the sin that ruins a life and r ruined the cross which Jesus lay. So we can see here that there is to be no yeast. Leviticus 2 and verse 11 amplifies that. It does it in a way that brings to us an understanding which is, is quite clear. In, verse, in chapter 2 and verse 11, it tells us these things. <clears throat> Every grain offering you bring to the Lord must be made without yeast, for you are not to burn any yeast or honey in a food offered, offering presented to the Lord. You may bring them to the Lord as an offering of the first fruits, but they are not to be offered on the altar as a pleasing aroma. Season all your grain offerings with salt, do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offering. Add salt to all of your offerings. You remember Jesus spoke about salt and how good it was um, and how it, it, walked, it moved into the, the aspect of His teaching and His training. But we also see that He's, he's given us that word there so that we won't bring yeast into our lives. We won't bring false teaching. We won't bring sin into our lives. And he re reiterates this with the Exodus because he knows that deep down this crowd of people, these many thousands of people with, that are, are noted in numbers, that they will automatically when they, they see that they have come out of a, what is perceived as a safe area, being that Egypt was so treacherous, but it was still safe. Each and every day they had somewhere to go. They had something to eat. They had a structure in their lives. But God's asking them to come out of that and, and exodus and, and move through faith in Him. And that's the contrast that we see. When faith is all that we can rely on, very often a person turns back to his old ways. He turns back to what he knows will please him and, and help them in different ways. So this is why the yeast is so, is so definite to be remembered. It's so definitely got to be attained to. And why he spends 10 verses on it. Moses wants us to know that the old ways that we are used to are no longer valid. We need to turn to God in faith and rely on Him only. So how can these false teachings come in? Well, one of the most clearest false teaching is that the cross of Jesus means nothing to us. 
And we see it again and again in the many different circles that we move, that people will not speak of such a barbaric way, that they'll not speak about such an inhumane way. And they very often say, that's not the God that I know. That's not the God of love. He couldn't have done such a thing to his only son. So, uh, this was a mistake. This was something that is, is, is not to be remembered. Yet Moses, yet Jesus, yet the church, they again and again need to remember the cross of Jesus. And we're thankful today that we are able to remember the cross, that we're able to celebrate all that Jesus did on that cross. Yet we hear people say again and again, is that not foolish? Is it not foolish that we would recognize it such a dark thing? Well, it's out of that darkness that came the light the light that shines around us, a light that shines for us, a light that today in heaven intercedes for us. And that's the blessing of knowing that the teaching of the cross is precious to each and every one of us. So much so that God asked for the firstborn of every, every household, the firstborn of a son and the firstborn of animal, of person and of creed. And we see that in this chapter, in verses 11 to 16, there is a, a big emphasis on firstborn, the firstborn of each generation, of each household, of each person. And many people ask, why was that brought about? Why was it such a big thing about the firstborn of every purse, of every household? Well, we see that in all aspects of the Bible, even from the beginning of Genesis, we see the firstborn is really something that we need to attain to. And Pharaoh knew such as this in his life. He knew that the firstborn of every uh, man and woman was precious. He was in Egypt, the one who, who started the killing of the firstborn when he asked for those in Moses' generation to be slain to be killed. And we see the beautiful story of Moses comes out of this and the redemption of the people of God is in its infancy. See, God has a special place for all firstborn children, for anything firstborn. In Genesis 12, 3, this is what he says of the people of, to Abraham. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they went out to the land of Cana and they arrived there. Further on, it's, it's, it states there that the people would be blessed through Abraham and Sarah. The firstborn would be the blessing to all the nations. So we see that 
God has a special place for those who are firstborn. He will bless and He will curse all that come from that. But when we look at that special thing, we don't realize the magnitude of what it meant for the people. See, the Levites were brought to be priests, and they were priests of His temple. And we would see that if we looked on in Leviticus and and so on. We would see that God wants the most primary people. The firstborn are given that special blessing. The firstborn are the in cultural, ancient cultural history, they are recognized as being the prime of the family they're, they're for their human strength and their uh, vitality. In Exodus, we, we read this tonight in Exodus 13, the consecration in remembrance of deliverance is, is through the firstborn. The final plague which we we read of um, this morning, was the Passover, but it was the Passover of the firstborn. We see that Jesus Christ is the firstborn of God. He's not created, but He existed with God. But He's the firstborn of Mary, born of the Holy Spirit. So we see again, that Jesus Christ is the blessed one, the Messiah. If we go back into the Psalms, we sing King David echoes Jesus in Psalm 89 when he speaks about him being the promised one. Hebrews 1 verse 2, he'd be the heir of all things. Hebrews 1 verse 6 tells us he'd be the firstborn of the world. In Revelations 1 verse 5, he'd be the first from, firstborn from the dead, paying our way of sin. 1 Corinthians 15, if we can turn to that and read it, it's so eloquently put, it it makes for a good understanding of what we're looking at. 15, 20, verse 20, but Christ was indeed being raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man. The resurrection of the dead comes through a man, also comes through a man. For as in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. But teach in turn Christ the first fruits, then when He comes, those who belong to Him. Then the end will come. When He hands over the kingdom of God the Father, after He has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. He must reign until He puts all His enemies under His feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Because of the first fruit, because of the firstborn, because of Jesus, all dominion and power will pass to Him. He will reign forever. He will bless His people. Then we see the parting from Egypt. And this is crucial in what we've looked at in the first two aspects. Verse 17 to 22 shows us that they went ahead. They went ahead towards the promised land. And if we look at those verses in chapter 13, we see that there's an amazing understanding for each and every one of us. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them over the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. 
For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He, sa he had said, God will surely come to your aid, and, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. Then we go on to see the, next, the, the last aspect that I want to speak to, but we see that they went ahead. They went ahead and they didn't go the easy route. Jesus didn't just point them in a direction and say, walk as the crow flies, which is the route, the path that we always want to go. If you're, if you're ever on your travels or if you're ever going anywhere, you always pick the shortest route, especially in these days of expensive fuel and travel. We always pick, pick which is the the quickest way, because we think it's the cheapest way. And we do the same in life, don't we? We're, we're very much like the Israelites, because the Israelites always wanted it easy. They never wanted, they never wanted to seek what God wanted. They always wanted to go the easy route for them. But God took them one way, this way, round the desert way, the wilderness way, for a reason. It was to teach them that they must rely on Him, that they must see His will as being the way forward. And why was that? Well, he explains it, doesn't it? He, Moses explains it because he says, if the people go this way, they have just come out of slavery. They don't know how to protect themselves. They don't know how to stand up for themselves. They're not ready to fight somebody. If they see a big battle, if they see something that is going to make them struggle, they're going to turn tail and run back to Egypt because that's the safest place for them. At least they know what they had back there. They had structure. They had food. Yes, they had slavery and pain and oppression, but they knew what it was. And out of that comes that saying, better the devil you know. But we don't want to know him. We have a savior. We have a light. We have somebody who we can have faith in. God wanted to teach them the way ahead, His way ahead, for good reason. But He didn't say, do it on your own steam. He didn't say, I'll, I'll be there from a distance. I'll just keep an eye on you and make sure you don't get into trouble as some of us would think in our own lives. And as the world looks on and says, but your God is not a God who lives with you. Where is your God? The psalmist said. Where is He now? Well, we know He's present here with us tonight. We know that He's in heaven interceding for us. We know that He sent His Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Likewise, the Lord sent. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. You know, when we conjure up in our minds what that pillar must have looked like, we can't, we can't quite imagine other than it might have been a cloud, but when we, when we think of the darkness that came in Calvary, when we think of the darkness that Moses instilled on the, the Egyptians, being it was the ninth 
plague that came. It was touchable, it was tangible, it was, it was something you could feel. And similar is the, the Hebrew for the pillar of cloud and the pillar of flower, of fire. The, these pillars were tangible and touchable, and there was, you could see them, you could experience them, you knew they were there. Just like you and I know that the Holy Spirit is here with us now. That once we trusted in Jesus, He came into our lives and He rests there to give us the peace that as Alastair prayed, the world does not understand nor can even fathom. That's the pillow of cloud and the pillar of fire in our lives. In the pillar of cloud, His presence was there. His protection was there. And His phenomenon was real. Is that what we can say of our lives with the Lord Jesus? Is His presence with us? We know His protection is a phenomenon real to us. Well, if it's not, we need, we need the pillar of fire in our lives. Because again, His presence is there, but His comfort is also in our lives. A comfort for when it's hard, when it's not easy. But also, there's a light. And there's, like there's a light in the darkness where the Israelites were in the wilderness, there is also a light in our lives. And it's in the darkness of this world. It's in the wilderness of this time. We read in Exodus 14, as we, as we move on to the next few chapters, we read there that God troubled the Egyptians. He troubled the Egyptians through the cloud by day and by night. And we see what that meant to them. But what it means for us is that He will never leave us nor forsake us. His faithfulness never fails. You know, there's a commentator who sums this whole, this whole chapter up in, in one small sentence. He will always rescue us. Remember that when we go out this week. He will always rescue you. Amen. Let's pray before we bring our time to a close and sing in our last item of praise. Father, it's in these times that we come before you and we know your presence is with us and we know that you lead us along the path that is very narrow. Lord, very often we look at the, the wide path and we think it would be easier. But Lord, wherever we are, we need to be on that path with you. You guiding us, Lord, as the shepherd, not pushing us as the hired hand. And Lord, we look to you this night in all our troubles, in all our days, in all the things we see around us. We look to a troubled world which is lost without you. There's nowhere to be seen on any path. A people, Lord, that are 
misguided and falsely taught and, Lord, not even governed by our, our nation's leaders. And Lord, it saddens and sinks our hearts. We see our youth, Lord, being torn this way and the other and not knowing what even their purpose is in life. And Lord, out of this teaching today, Lord, we, we ask that you would teach us to be a people of faith and to cry out to you and to look for your pillar of cloud that will lead us through the days. And Lord, particularly at night, that we would look for your fire, that your Holy Spirit would be present with us and in us and around us and lead us through the darkness of this world to keep our eyes fixed on you, to keep our focus on the gospel. And Lord, to keep our fellowship within your family. Lord, we pray that you would go with us and you would keep us by your side as we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our last item of praise. Uh, Jesus, uh, and, and I hear the Savior say that strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. The words say that, sorry, getting ahead of you. He's wanting me to finish. Because Jesus paid it all, all for him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength and deed us all, Child of weakness, watch and of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on you and remain with you and all whom you love and pray for both this day and forevermore. Amen.